There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, title for this evening's presentation is The Mahayana Mind. Um, we uh, will be talking a little bit about uh, the way that the mind is discussed in uh, this view. And like I said, uh, relate it back to uh, Tantai uh, philosophy. So I wanna make sure, pull this down, go. Um, so uh, when, we, um, when we look at some of the major works of um, Master G, um, uh, the, what we see represented a lot, especially with respect to the commentaries uh, that uh, he discusses, um, we see uh, most frequently references to the Daji Dalun, um, which is the, uh, translated as the Treatise on the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, um, which is so from the, um, uh, the Prajnaparamita uh, sort of genre of text. Um, we also see uh, a fair amount of reliance on the Zhonglun or uh, uh, Middle Treatise, which is the um, Chinese translation of Nagarjuna's uh, Mola Majamika Karaka, sort of the, the um, probably the, the best known uh, Majamika or Buddhist centrist um, philosophical text. Um, when we look at the taxonomy of uh, the teachings, um, uh, beginning with the, the Agamas and then um, the moving from there, the shared teachings, that's really where, uh, where those that are most often referenced um, would be placed is in those shared teachings. Um, the next beyond that, um, the, the separate teachings, um, which is what we'll be focusing on here, um, is often not discussed explicitly at length. And then, of course, uh, a great amount of time is spent in those writings um, on uh, the round or perfect teachings relating back to the Lotus Sutra. Um, what we do find, though, uh, discussed, especially um, when we uh, when we look at the Mohe Jiguan, um, are extensive uh, discussions of contemplation of mind and uh, Dharma nature. Um, and uh, these, are, these are topics that when one starts to study Yogacara, mind-only teachings are very common themes. Um, and, you know, in many ways, these topics are sort of in the water, so to speak. Um, at the, the time in the seventh century when Ji is writing. Um, and so these, these ideas are, are very influential um, in these texts uh, and in the practices that these texts are um, trying to provide uh, guidance around without um, having that sort of explicit connection being made. Um, in some ways this contributes to, there's a really common trope uh, when people uh, uh, study uh, medieval uh, Chinese Buddhism uh, to describe Tiantai as uh, the Majamaka school and Huayan um, based on the Buddha Abhatamsaka Sutra as the Yogacara mind only school. Um, and part of what we'll sort through here is that distinction is, um, Really more of a stereotype than really grounded in the reality of um, what we see and how these these ideas actually influence Tiantai teachings. Uh, I want to um, uh, provide. Uh, I will say this is um, this is a field that um, scholars spend years on. Um, I'm going to sp spend 20 to 30 minutes here uh, talking about some of this. Um, it's very difficult. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't receive a lot of space um, in some of these settings is because it is, it's actually quite involved, quite technical. Um, I'm really going to skim the surface with the hope that I make enough sense <laughs> that I make a point here at the end <laughs> for you that you can take away from this. Um, but it's something uh, that I'm uh, both uh, very interested in. And I will say when I was a student of this content in grad school, I was a very bad student. And so I spent <laughs> a lot of time sort of as penance trying to um, uh, become a lot more literate in this. Um, one of the uh, one of the primary distinctions that we find between uh, Yogacara mind only um, teachings and uh, Majamaka is that whereas Majamaka really is a logic that focuses on negating 
any posited idea about reality. Um, Yogacara really takes the, embraces the teaching of emptiness, but then attempts to move beyond this um, idea of uh, experiencing emptiness only through negation. We're trying to describe what this ineffable experience is and what it's, uh, what the path is that leads to it. Um, and that path is really fundamental to studying uh, these teachings. Um, one of the things that uh, people will find as you access a good deal of uh, English language writings on these teachings, they tend to come from uh, specialists uh, in fields of speculative philosophy. Um, people are very interested in comparing Yogacara, for instance, to um, Kantian idealism or um, uh, Husserl's ideas around phenomenology, um, which if that's your thing, that's fine. Um, it's, there's, it's very difficult for a lay person or even really committed practitioner to take a lot out of those writings because fundamentally the tradition um, was uh, engaging with these writings. These writings were created for and they were studied by people who were participating in regular, fairly committed meditative practice. Um, and that's really um, you know, where the, the term yoga chara comes from. We're talking about a path of yoga practice. Um, and so in that way, I, you know, I, I note here, it's somewhat more akin to an artistic movement. This is people putting something into action from a frame of mind, thinking about how they're engaged with meditation practice. Um, and it's to the end of experiencing Anuttara Samak Sambodhi. Um, it is, uh, we, we take the mind as the field of practice, break down those different components of mind, um, and then apply our understanding of those components of mind in order to have an experience of emptiness leading us to enlightenment. So what's the big idea? Um, with Yogacara. Um, I, I have here the first verse from um, uh, uh, actually one of the later um, uh, sort of classical treatises, um, treatise in 30 verses from Vasubandhu. Um, that which is called self and that which are called dharmas are merely the flowing change of consciousness. Um, and so what do we mean by dharmas in this context? Because dharma actually can have a lot of different valences and Buddhist rhetoric. But um, so when we talk about dharmas, we're talking about um, our momentary experiences of what we perceive of as reality. And so dharmas are those, um, those uh, perceptions that happen through our six senses, um, our five physical senses and the mental sense. Um, and this verse speaks in a very pith way to the fact that um, what we are experiencing as uh, a subject object duality is actually just this movement of consciousness without any real distinction between these things. Um, you know, uh, the image I have in the background from a movie that I really like, Inception, um, it's a sci-fi movie for people who aren't familiar with it, um, about uh, these special agents that essentially hack into people's dreams and experience sort of the breakdown of um, the, the laws of physics inside of, you know, as many of us experience in dreams where um, uh, narrative continuity, um, uh, things like gravity, um, simply disappear as we're in this space where our minds really can wander and uh, do different things. Um, and in some ways, what Yogacara is um, telling us is that actually our mundane everyday experience is really no different than that sort of dream space where everything seems to sort of break down and kind of flippity flop. Um, and that is, um, that is a, a really difficult proposition to embrace without spending a lot of time practicing with this. Um, but I do want to begin to introduce that sort of more radical notion at the front as we start to break this down into different concepts. Um, so you can understand where we're going to is to really utterly disrupt our everyday experience of life. So stepping back, 
Um, when we talk about consciousness um, from the perspective of uh, Nikaya Buddhism, we have those these six components that I mentioned, and um, you will, uh, for those participating in uh, the service, we'll chant the Heart Sutra, and we chant these, um, you know, about these consciousnesses. And in the Heart Sutra and the, that Prajnaparamita literature, we're talking about these things that we've described as also being empty of real existence. Um, and so this is the basis. This is sort of what we say, necessarily all Buddhism that is a little uh, too reductive, but fundamentally for foundational Buddhism, these are the six consciousnesses that we're dealing with of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and that, that mental uh, consciousness. But Yogacara, um, part of what it does is moves beyond these six categories of mind, so to speak. This is talk about the Mahayana mind, what are we talking about? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I say when we start to get into this, well, why, why even ask, why even, why even engage in this sort of description and speculation? Um, and, you know, I think when we look, when you look at the literature, what we find is they're asking questions around continuity and discontinuity of consciousness. As I like to say, what happened when I blacked out? So when we fall asleep, when we have experiences of unconsciousness, um, like where we pass out, we go into a coma, the experience between dying and being born, we have these experiences of discontinuity in our consciousness along the way, um, where we don't know what happened. And yet somehow through the nature of cause and effect, a subsequent moment of conscious mind still arises from that moment when we had blacked out, we have no memory of it. Um, so how can that be? And this is really what this mind only school starts to dive into in order to create this new architecture of mind. Um, and one of the, the uh, major components that uh, it sort of innovates will say or describes newly um, within the tradition is this idea of the alaya vijnana or storehouse consciousness. Um, and this storehouse consciousness is holding all of the karmic seeds that have accumulated uh, from throughout beginningless time, from your very uh, from the very beginning of your your the existence of the mental continuum that manifests today as your experience here listening to me. Um, in each moment of time, there is a moment of volition. So if you uh, uh, talked about, learned about, heard about uh, the sort of karmic theory, there's a moment of volition or intention that leads to an action that has an outcome with some sort of response to what that outcome was, whether it was celebration or regret. Um, that plants uh, is referred to as a seed in that storehouse consciousness. That storehouse consciousness is carrying all of both the wholesome and unwholesome seeds from beginningless time all the way through. The other form of consciousness that is sort of layered in between this alaya and our perceptual, what we might say in uh, Western psychology, our conscious mind um, is this clistomanus or uh, afflicted mind. Uh, I had a professor that sometimes would refer to this as the disc jockey. Um, the clistomanus is experiencing these seeds that mature in the alaya vijjana as a self. It's seeing these karmic seeds come to fruition and saying, that's me, that's who I am. And then translating that experience of self into how our perceptual mind, those six consciousnesses, encounter dharmas, saying that's something other, that's something out there. And of course, that alaya vijjana is filled with all kinds of intentions and all kinds of wholesome and unwholesome conditioning that shapes how we respond as a self, as a, de a delusional self to what we experience out there. And then based on this delusion of a self experiencing things externally, takes in that data as, as if it's coming from somewhere else and planting it back in to that alaya, into that storehouse as new seeds. This new architecture of mind really changes how practitioners begin to understand 
what's happening. So our experiences, what we encounter on a, uh, on a perceptual level are not merely what we might take for granted that they are as just something outside of me that's happening, but are in fact only knowable to us as some condition of our own mind. And that's really when we talk, when uh, tradition references mind only, what it's talking about. It's saying we can only know these dharmas through the lens of our mind. It's not saying the out external world doesn't exist. It's actually really agnostic around that. It's like in many, uh, like many of the things that the uh, Buddhist community teaches about saying, that's not really relevant. What matters is how you know it, how you come to it and how you deal with it. What do you do with that? And so that warehouse storehouse of seeds um, uh, contains within it um, fundamentally what are referred to as the two hindrances. Um, the, the first um, uh, sort of hindrance that is uh, discussed and we work with all the time are affective or the emotional hindrances. Um, so, uh, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion are the core ones. The literature uses several different taxonomies. So if you've heard of um, the Abhidharma or have read about Abhidharma, um, and there are various forms of uh, Mahayana, Yogacara, Abhidharma texts. So they use different lists of these different uh, sorts of afflictions. Um, but each one of these, uh, you know, is, if you go through that literature, you can uh, likely identify with all of them. I know that I certainly can. Um, if you, uh, if any of them don't land for you, good for you, or you might also be participating in delusion. Um, so those uh, afflictive hindrances are the first piece that we are um, uh, lifting off um, as we work through our practice. Um, and these are really the primary hindrances uh, that uh, Nakai Buddhism is addressing is um, uh, if, we, if we can lift up these uh, or, or uh, remove these uh, 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 emotional uh, challenges from our consciousness, we can have some sort of peaceful experience. The yoga chart uh, mind only tradition also addresses these cognitive hindrances. Um, and fundamentally, when they're talking about cognitive hindrances, what it boils down to is that uh, belief in uh, subject object duality of self and other, as long as that, um, that real belief is maintained, um, and not just in, well, do I think that that's true or not? But is that actually how I experience my life? Do I experience my life as um, uh, a person separate from the world around me, separate from the people around me? Or do I actually experience these dharmas, right? At the What's coming in, so to speak, um, as actually that transformation of consciousness, like Vasubandhu talks about at the beginning of the uh, 30 verses treatise. And so this is a long path. If we talk about what we've accumulated since beginning this time, and we're making the commitment now to take the Bodhisattva vows, to remove all of those um, various uh, hindrances, obscurations, um, I would certainly take a, <laughs> quite a good deal of time. The, um, the tradition refers to that time period um, uh, that it takes as three kalpas. Um, and off the cuff, I'm not going to define a kalpa for you. We've really talked about that. Sort of an eon. It's a, it's a very, very long time. Um, and so this we compare to um, in the Tantai context um, of that perfect and sudden enlightenment. Um, and this is... Where the, where the teachings within the Tendai, Tendai tradition um, start to, again, transcend, move beyond um, the, the separate teachings of Yogacara and mind only. But what I think is really relevant is, well, um, we are uh, participating in uh, a belief that the, you know, the, this path can lead to a sudden awakening. We're also, I don't know about you all, and maybe some, some folks are having that experience. I know that for me, I have to break this down on a day to day. I, it's all happening all the time. So um, it's really useful to understand these categories of mind to have this sort of map to work with. Now, um, to lay out then, how do we begin to understand or examine 
any dharma, any experience through this lens. One of the, um, one of the concepts uh, that the tradition provides is this idea of the three natures. Um, so Tapu talked about dharma nature um, and uh, Master G's uh, writings talks about uh, dharma, uh, the nature of dharmas. Um, and in uh, the Yogacara, Mind Only Teachings talks about the three natures um, and a, um, a metaphor that it uses for every Dharma having three natures is to talk about um, walking, uh, you know, walking down a path and encountering at first what you believe to be a snake. And upon closer examination, realizing, oh, it's actually a uh, length of rope coiled up. Now, if we take that examination from a Mahayana perspective, just the next step farther, we realize, oh, it's nature is actually emptiness. And so that's the fundamental uh, sort of point of the three natures is the initial imagined nature, what we call is um, the sort of naive, unexamined um, experience of uh, our life. So that, that notion of like, well, I'm here and life is out there. That's how it is. Um, take up the next level in, and this is, uh, again, kind of points back to this um, uh, uh, mode of examining, going back to foundational Buddhism of, of cause and effect. What are the causes and conditions that lead to me con uh, conventionally experiencing whatever I'm experiencing here? And so, uh, you know, just on one level, we may say my experience of a Dharma is the coming together of an external sense object, a sense organ, and that sense consciousness. That's what those three ayatanas give rise to this experience, one way of thinking about dependent nature. And then beyond that, as I examine it more closely, there's no truly existing experience to be found. And that three natures idea really ties into when we look at the Tian Tai teachings, um, especially around the threefold truth um, and threefold contemplation, um, we find something very similar. We start to recognize that actually um, Master Ji was, may have been drawing from something really important within the Mahayana tradition, within this Yogacara mind-only tradition, um, as he frames this threefold contemplation, the threefold nature of truth, um, that we have this provisional, um, and actually the, the Chinese word, and I, my Mandarin is not very good, but I know, I know from uh, studying that uh, this term, uh, actually is, uh, can be understood almost as, uh, it has the connotation of lie, <laughs> that it's, it's a non-truth. Um, and uh, so that's the sort of the, the first uh, nature of the, the, the dharmas that we encounter. Um, and then moving through the other side, when we follow that threefold contemplation, we go all the way to the other side and recognize um, from, uh, that this lie empty of any real existence is also, um, also has, uh, you know, from that ultimate side, something meaningful, useful that we can attend to. And that is what we find in that middle truth. Um, and so these three natures really tie in kind of uh, uh, lead rather elegantly to that threefold contemplation and truth. Um, in the Tiantai tradition. And so there's, there's really something very important as we look through all of this uh, um, as Tendai practitioners, um, that may be really worthwhile uh, spending time with um, and uh, allowing to begin to influence our practice, our studies. Now, I, there's a lot of concepts there. Um, I've talked about a lot of different things. What I want to um, offer just as some takeaways because Yogacara is Kind of huge, and what do we what do we do with this? Um, the three sort of bullet points that I would want people to take away from this first is that bias is woven through every experience that we have. Um, it's become much more uh, common and accessible to talk about bias in sort of a more social and political sense, and those are critical examinations for us to do, and also to recognize just that even our notions of how we perceive the world are writ through with bias. So if we know that and we allow that to just be part of our reality, we then are in a place where we can invite in 
curiosity, calm into our experience of life, not only in our meditation, but we might call it post-meditation. How do we allow this understanding that everything that we're experiencing is shaded by all of the experiences we've had since beginning this time is to wonder about how, why do I see it that way? Why does it appear that way to me? Why do I feel this way about these experiences right now? Um, and then as we begin to engage with that examination, to have a sense of humor specifically about this idea of self, to be able to laugh at our ideas and our clinging to self, to have the resilience to be able to continue to engage. Because especially from a Western context, um, it is very easy to begin to become burdened by shame around the fact that we are stuck in this thing. And that will only reinforce our sense of self that we need to be able to move beyond. Um, so being able to be sincerely silly about the sort of self that we can't quite seem to shake from day to day, I think is all is really important to how we, what we can take away from these uh, learning about this Yogacara mind only view. So, um, as I wrap up, I just wanted to touch on some resources um, that relied on here and I would recommend for others. Um, uh, we have a few here, uh, Carl Brunholtz's uh, uh, commentaries in translation of the compendium of the Mahayana. This is a very, very large um, <laughs> three volume set, but it is, if anybody's ever read anything by Dr. Brunholtz, it's an incredible resource. Um, translations that are a bit clunkier, but still really helpful from Stefan Onaker from Vasubandhu. So these are translations in modern scholarship on a very accessible level. So hold it this way first, you can see it's a lot more approachable. Living Yogacara, which is a translation from uh, Charles Muller of uh, Hoso, a um, uh, priest in Japan, um, is a great resource. Um, more philosophical and academic, but still really useful is from Dan Listhaus, uh, Buddhist Phenomenology. Um, so those are just some plugs that I wanted to uh, throw out there. Um, as uh, if you're interested in examining more. And to note this caution at the bottom, there are a lot of very unhelpful yoga chart mind only resources. Um, so if you do ever need guidance, please uh, check in with the teacher and um, uh, look for some direction on what is best for you. So, all right. Um, so that's my presentation. I wanna um, ask uh, Munchen and Ichishima Sensei if there's anything that you wanna offer or <laughs> correct about anything I, I presented here this evening. Ichishima Sensei, do you have any comments that you would like to make? Why don't you put it onto the... Um, I'm actually not in control of it right now. Um, do you mind ending the screen share? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting topic you suggested to us. <clears throat> I think yoga chara is very important uh, uh, philosophy uh, in between maybe Madhyamika and Tentai Buddhism. And uh, yoga chara actually founded by Asanga, as you mentioned in the uh, notes, that uh, Mahayana Sangraha. And that is very important, uh, I think, text. And uh, uh, they, it, uh, it says that the three modes of experience you mentioned. Uh, one is Henge uh, Shoshujo or Parikarupita. Uh, that is a mo uh, mode of existence produced from one's attachment, imaginary experience uh, from the Buddhist point of view, and uh, which includes all existence uh, considered to be reality, really existing because of our innate attachment. The second is etakisho or paratantra, uh, the mode of existence originating from causes and condition. The third is uh, enjo jisho, the mode of existence conforming to the uh, ultimate reality. So these three uh, modes of existence is the basis of yogacara, and especially very important point is uh, Ashraya Parabriti, turning point of mind from the uh, illusory to uh, perfect enlightenment. 
So that is Ara Vijnana is eighth consciousness, which includes every consciousness. But by hearing uh, <coughs> Dharma, uh, then that Dharma penetrates to our uh, uh, consciousness, Ara um, Vijnana, then gradu gradually, you know, that uh, kind of good effect of hearing uh, Dharma that uh, really purify uh, Ara Vijnana. Just like Hamsa bird, that is uh, imaginary bird, but uh, I think uh, uh, goose, uh, you know, can uh, eliminate only milk out of water. This is very important uh, parable that uh, when Asanga uh, uh, visit his uh, brother Vasvandu, uh, he uh, encountered with, uh, uh, you know, the goose babies just uh, uh, drinks only milk out of water. I think that is a very awakening point of uh, Yogacara or by Basbandu's uh, 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 brother, elder brother, uh, Mujaku. So Asanga's uh, point is very uh, interesting. You know, when I was uh, middle school, uh, I, I uh, raised a goose, a goose baby, and then I found that uh, you know goose baby can drinks only uh, milk out of water. We cannot separate milk and water, or you see, uh, but the uh, goose baby can eliminate only uh, drinks uh, milk out of uh, water. Uh, it was very surprising experience for myself. <clears throat> That was a starting point how I studied Yogacara uh, at the university. And it is very interesting. Uh, so if you read the English translation of Mahayana Sangraha by Asanga, uh, <clears throat> printed in, I think, BDK, uh, 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 they produced that Asanga's uh, Mahayana Sangraha. Uh, that is also very interesting to understand uh, how uh, uh, Yogacara started. Of course, Baswandus is a very important person, but his uh, elder brother Asanga's point is very interesting and awakening. And so this, uh, these three modes of existence is very comparable to the Sandai uh, in Tendai Triple Truths, you know, Kutai, Ketai, and Chutai. So uh, I think uh, GJ, GE, founder of Jap Chinese Tendai Buddhism, he really influenced by such Yogacara system uh, to produce such a three modes of existence. Uh, that is my comment. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Sensei. Um, the only comment that I was going to make is that often um, in philosophical treatises in, in English, in English philosophical treatises, we look at Yogacara and Majjhima, Majjhimaka teachings as sort of a counter to each other. We view them as it's either Majjhimaka or it's Yogacara, when in fact, the two are complementary. They, they really work with each other, even though Let's say the Shingon school may be more dependent upon Yogacara, the Tiantai Tendai school is a little bit more dependent upon Majamaka. You really can't say, well, I'm Tendai, so I'm only going to study Majamaka, or I'm Shingon, so I'm only going to study Yogacara. You really have to study them together because they're, they're addressing slightly different aspects of the nature of reality. And I think that it's important to remember that, that we don't eliminate one because, well, that's not what our school is based upon. As Ichishima Sensei was mentioning, as you had mentioned earlier, that, that uh, Chigi was really very influenced by Yogacara philosophy 
in many of his and many of his teachings, although he is more dependent upon Majamaka, but that doesn't mean that he ignores the yoga chart. And I just wanted to mention that. Why don't we open it up to um, a broader questions? Anybody who has any questions? Mm -hmm. And thank you. And, and I, I should have said from the beginning, but I got involved in something else. I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.